I'm Elizabeth uh, Abel, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I have an MSW from UNCC and my LCSWA, which means I'm a licensed clinical social worker associate. Um, here on this lovely day, why is my computer being weird? Okay, so a little bit about me. Um, I, once again, have an MSW from UNCC. I was diagnosed with ADHD in 2018, um, which is not that long ago. Um, and I served on the student advisory board for the Office of Disability Services when I was here um, getting my MSW. So I'm very familiar with how things work around here uh, at UNCC when it comes to disability stuff. Um, I have a private practice as a therapist and consultant that focuses on ADHD. So my life is essentially just ADHD all the time. Recently had to step away from a conversation at a party because they were starting to talk about ADHD and I was like, this is work. I'm gonna go somewhere else. Um, and also just fun fact, I volunteer at the Carolina Raptor Center. I love birds, that is my current hyper-focus um, and what keeps me sane after working with people all the time. Um, so if my exuberant behavior and energy level doesn't already cue you into ADHD, the fact that I have it, um, just wanted to let you know that I accidentally scheduled at least two other appointments over this time slot uh, where I was doing this presentation and thankfully I caught it. But uh, yeah, that was fun. Um, had to switch some stuff around. All right, so before we begin, let's just get on the same page about a few things. Um, first of all, disabled is not a bad word, um, as you might think, oh no, disability, ooh, bad. No, disability is not a bad word. Disability is not a bad thing. Um, I do consider ADHD a disability. Um, some people say, oh, it's just a different way of thinking. Well true, um, but it does also impact more than just the way my, I think, um, it affects behavior, it affects lots of things, and according to the ADA, that would then be considered a disability. Um, let's remember that accessibility goes beyond ramps and bathrooms. Ramps and bathrooms are really important. It's important to have accessible ramps and bathrooms. However, there are lots of other things in this world, especially for folks that have ADHD, that make the world inaccessible to us. Um, and because of that, most employers probably don't understand ADHD. Um, and if you are an employer, I hope that you glean some information from this um, and you can uh, learn how to better support your employees. Good thing to know is that things that help people with ADHD will also help other people um, because, you know, people get distracted, yes, um, and distractions are hard to work with. It is also important to recognize that even though many people get distracted, you know, everyone has the ability to get distracted, Folks with ADHD have a much harder time and it is constant. Um, it's not like a, oh, it's Tuesday and one little thing has happened, now I'm distracted. It's basically all the time. Um, the other thing I just wanna say is oh, because of society, we really shouldn't have to do this much work to get accommodations in the workplace, but the reality is we do. So um, if you have questions about that in more detail, um, I'll go into some and we can talk about it more later. All right, so the big question is, does ADHD really impact work? And the answer is yes, it does. Um, so ADHD does not go away when you enter adulthood. Many people who are diagnosed as children might've been told or their parents might've been told, oh, they're gonna outgrow it. Um, that's, not, that's not true. Um, sure, you stop missing homework assignments or you know, having a messy backpack, but that just translates into having, you know, late bills or a messy house, um, those sorts of things. So the, the truth is, is that um, ADHD is not going to go away when you reach adulthood and therefore you become, you know, you go from student with ADHD to employee with ADHD. Um, you know, without the structure of school, um, life can be really challenging. And even if work has a structure, there's still a lot of other pieces that school provides that you don't get um, when you're working. Um, ADHD impacts your executive function. And this makes adulting, air quotes, um, particularly difficult um, because most of those, most of the tasks um, require, required in work and in life require executive function and a lot of it. Um, and then finally, workplaces like the rest of society um, are filled with misunderstandings about ADHD. And those misunderstandings cause lots of external barriers that can make work environments inaccessible to people with ADHD. And so we're gonna talk about some of those today. 
Um, and believe me, this is not an exhaustive list of things because I could probably do a semester long course on ADHD in the workplace um, in general. So people like to talk about executive function and ADHD, but rarely do I ever see people actually explain what those are. So I'm just gonna take a moment to talk about what those are so that maybe you can better see your own life through the lens of executive function, or if you're an employer, better understand where places in the work space um, are uh, impacted. Was there a question, Sam? No, okay, cool. All right, so executive functions, um, and this is these are all taken from the uh, Brown Executive Function and Attention Scales by Thomas E. Brown. Um, so activation, um, organizing, prioritizing, and activating to work. So getting started on something. If you ha find yourself um, having a really hard time just starting uh, a task, anything, that's activation. That's the activation part of executive function. Focus, pretty self-explanatory. It's focusing, sustaining, and shifting attention to tasks. So obviously staying focused on something, um, the ability to um, continuously focus, and then also the, the ability to say, oh, this also needs my attention and shift it that way um, versus, you know, the thing you're doing right now is really fun and you don't want to stop doing it. Oh, ah. um, effort. Effort um, has to do with regulating the alertness, sustaining effort, and adjusting processing speed. So that's like um, how fast or slow um, how much intensity you're going to do an activity or a task. Um, so if you do a task too quickly, you might make careless errors or mistakes. If you're doing an activity too slowly, you might kind of lose interest and get bored. Um, so that's part of the effort um, and staying alert to it. Um, so emotions are a big part of um, executive function. Um, managing frustration and modulating emotions, really important thing to do when you're in a job, <laughs> but people often will forget that that's part of executive function and then label someone as dramatic or overly sensitive. Um, but if you get frustrated at work and, you know, you're not able to uh, modulate and manage that frustration, that can, that can become a, a, an issue. Um, it's not that you can't, um, but it is a challenge, right? So memory, utilizing working memory and accessing recall. That's a big one. Um, if employers were to tell you to do several tasks at once, um, holding all that information in your head can be a really big challenge. Remembering to do certain tasks, um, remembering to write down the stuff that you're supposed to be doing, all of those pieces are, are tied to memory. And then finally, there's action as part of executive function, and that's monitoring and self rate I find that that's usually people say executive function, but then they don't actually talk about them. So they're like, oh, executive functions. Uh, not gonna tell you what that is or why it's important. All right, so here you are. You have ADHD and you have to find a job. So it's time to shove your neurodivergent self into a neurotypical environment. Um, and one of those things is open concept offices. Also now shared spaces, you're sharing an office. This also applies to something that I've seen with my clients as they're returning to work is like the hotel stations where you don't have an assigned office uh, space. You just kind of have like a cubby or whatnot. Um, so for ADHD, these are trendy, terrible, and an absolute nightmare. Um, I tried to think of some pros and cons. Um, the pro that I came up with um, after trying really hard is accountability in an open concept sort of office space where everything's open. You don't have a door to your office. Um, people can see what you're doing and that might keep you off of Reddit or YouTube or Facebook or whatever, because there's a set of eyes on you. Um, that's a pro. If anyone has any other pros of an open concept office and you have uh, ADHD, please feel free to share. Um, I'd be happy to take any suggestions. The cons, <laughs> noise. How do you make noise go away when it's an open space? Um, visual distractions. Um, and I'm, I'm sitting here in this office space that I'm in right now and going, oh, the windows. Every time someone passes, I'm like, oh, there's a person. Um, open concept, even worse, right? Because not only can you see them, you can hear them. Um, social temptations. If you're a social animal of the ADHD variety and you like to talk to people, it's hard if they're sitting there and you're not supposed to talk to them. Um, you can't hide clutter when you're in an open concept office space. And for those 
ADHD folks who have the uh, files not pi or piles not files way of life, it can be stressful to manage a space. People are walking by, they're like, you need to clean that up. And you're like, but if I don't have it out in front of me, I don't know where it is. Yeah. It's hard, right? Maintaining professionalism is what they might say. Um, and then finally, transporting your materials if you're using a shared space. Um, and this can be, this is a challenge whether or not you're in an open concept office or not. Maybe you don't have a job that's in an office space, but taking all of your stuff to and from work, that's a lot of executive function that you need. That's planning, that's time. That can be a really big challenge. Um, so, you know, by the way, having clients right now in my in my practice who are returning to work and friends who are returning to work, employers, please do not charge your uh, employees to rent a locker space or to have to reserve a locker space. That is really a bad idea. Just give people a locker because they need it, whether or not they use it as their choice. Um, but if you can't provide that to all of your employees, then in my opinion, that's something to think about um, because having that, um, if you're going to have a shared office space, people should have a place to put their stuff. Um, all right. So what to do, what to do when you have like open concept offices or any sort of shared office space? Um, what sort of accommodations can you request? Um, now remember accommodations are, are dependent on the employer, um, but they need to be reasonable, right? Um, reasonable accommodations. So you can't be like, hello, I would like my own small hut in the middle of nowhere. Um, paid for by the company. That's not exactly a reasonable accommodation, but here are some that I felt were, depending on the en environment, could be a thing to ask for. Um, if you're in a space, um, perhaps some like partitions to put up, if you have like just desks and flat surface in front of you, can you put up a partition to help block out some of that visual distraction and the noise? Um, headphones. I was shoved into a shared office at a job once, and I was like, after having my own little tiny cubby of a closet office that was beautiful and wonderful, and I was just like, hey, can you provide me with headphones? Because I'm now in an office with four people and I can't concentrate and do my job. They obliged. Um, work from home days, and we can talk about work, we're gonna talk about work from home later, but sometimes if you're in a space that's really exhausting to field out all those distractions, working from home can potentially be a way to help um, that. Uh, if you can choose a desk, choose an, a one that faces a wall. I can have as much distraction that way. Um, and then if you can have flexible hours, you can potentially ask if it's okay for you to come in early or stay late um, as a way to, um, you're still in the office because Lord knows they want you in the office, um, but maybe you can come in earlier and get some work done before people come in, or you can stay late and get work done towards the end of the day. So anything in there? You good? So now, work from home. This slide has a lot more impact right now, given the state of the world. Uh, prior to the pandemic, I was already in the let me work from home mode, and I actually did work jobs from home. Um, but now it's even more on the table because we've recognized that not a lot of jobs have to be done in an office space, boo. Um, so um, here's the thing though, work from home is not easy for everyone and it's not going to be the same experiences if you have ADHD, it's all different, right? Um, so the yay work from homes, the pros of working from home is you're gonna have fewer interruptions from coworkers. Um, and just to make sure we understand, interruptions are, sort of like external things that are intentionally like coming at you like someone's like, I need something from you, interrupt. Um, your cat is like, I need love and interrupts you, it's external. Distractions are also external, but those are things that aren't really intentionally trying to get your attention, if that makes sense. So um, interruptions and perhaps fewer distractions from coworkers as well, the person that clicks their pen or whatnot. Um, but interruption wise, working from home, much better that way. Um, a big thing about working from home um, is reducing the preparation and travel time. Um, when you're getting ready in the morning for work, if you work in the morning, um, if you're like me, you take medication and that medication isn't going to kick in while you're getting ready for work. So um, 
you have to do a lot of tasks without the assistance of medication, unless you're on ones that kick in overnight, but that's whatever. Um, so it takes a lot of mental energy to get ready for work. And then you have to dr potentially drive to work. And that takes a lot of focus and concentration. And so some people might end up coming to work after getting ready and be completely exhausted um, before they start their day because getting ready for work is really stressful. <laughs> um, and it can be. Um, and if you're late, you know, that adds to it. So cutting that out and working from home saves a lot of that mental bandwidth and gives people an easier time to work. Um, so that's a big piece. And that's why I requested work from home time um, when I was working my other jobs, um, because I wanted to have a fresh start, just get up out of bed and start working instead of spending all of this time to put on clothes and take a shower and like things that were not necessary for my job to be done. Um, so that's part of the reason why working from home can be really great for folks with ADHD. Um, and then there's some flexibility depending on the type of job. Um, but you know, you might be able to take a shower in the middle of the day or eat whenever you want to, um, which is not as acceptable when you're in an office space. And then of course there's the no work from home when you have ADHD. And this, again, these are real for other people too, but it's even harder when you have ADHD. There are more distractions at home. Your bed might be very tantalizing. There might be a nice TV show that you would like to watch. Perhaps you've decided that the task you're supposed to do is not as fun as maybe, oh, I don't know, reorganizing your pantry, which doesn't need to be done, but it's more fulfilling than whatever task you have perhaps um, given to you. Um, so that's, that's difficult. There's also less accountability. There's not people checking in on you, right? People walking by. Um, and so autonomy is really important in that sense. And then of course, there's for the folks who can never stop working. They keep going. Um, an office space will provide you with pretty definitive beginning and end once you leave work is done. Having your work always with you can be really challenging for folks with ADHD, especially if you get into hyper focus mode and then suddenly it's like 2 a.m. and you're like, oh no, I've been working all this time. Um, that can be really stressful. So, any questions on that? All right. So, let's talk about flexible work hours for a second because for ADHDers, I have found that it is very tantalizing to have flexible work hours. And this applies to a wide range of jobs, right? Um, love the idea of flexible hours, but what you want to make sure you do when you're looking for a job and you have ADHD is clarify what is meant by flexible hours. Um, don't assume you know what it means because I have found that people have a lot of different ideas about what flexible hours mean. Um, in my experience, what I thought they meant was, oh, I get to choose my hours and I can work them when it's best for my brain, which might be like 6 a.m. or it might be 11 p.m. Whenever my brain turns on, I get to work. What they actually meant by flexible hours in some situations was you have to be available to us at a drop of the hat. You're the flexible one, not the employer, um, which um, in that case, uh, that is very challenging. And let me tell you why it is hard for people with ADHD to need to be called on in a drop of a hat. A, boundaries, y'all, like boundaries. It's different from being on call for a job. That's different, but, and good to take into consideration what being on call could mean. Um, if you have trouble with task switching, which is an often a common, common challenge for ADHD, it can be difficult to need to be called on at the drop of a hat. It's not saying that you can't be called on in a drop of a hat. Um, it's just, it's going to be a little bit more challenging and you might need a little more warning per se. Um, and the other thing that they actually meant for flexible hours at a job I encountered was that I get to pick my hours, but like I couldn't change them once I picked them. So it was flexible in choosing the hours, but it wasn't flexible in actually doing the work. Um, so I was like, oh, why? <laughs> um, so that was fun. I felt like I was in control, but I wasn't. All right, so here we go. Let's consider some things for different types of jobs that are going to lead you to be the keys to your success personally. Again, ADHD is different for everyone, but you know, there's some stuff that I think is good to keep in mind when we think about how your brain works. Because when you have ADHD, um, 
your brain is going to be activated and motivated by different things. And it's good to think about what your motivation is because Lord knows if there isn't a purpose behind a task or an action uh, for ADHD folks, it can be really excruciatingly difficult to do. Um, so, all right, so let's look at teamwork versus like autonomy versus teamwork when you're considering a job. So um, do you work better by yourself? Right? Are you more of an independent type? Um, do you prefer having support from other people um, when you're working on a project? Like, do you find yourself needing to reach out to people or do you like, you know, having someone to sort of pick up the slack for you? I personally just want to do it all myself most of the time. Um, and then if I'm working with Sue Ann, I'm like, ha, support, yay. Um, but small, small amount of support, not big stuff. Um, but some people prefer that, you know, they might like to get lost in a big team of people. That's their thing. It's not mine, but it could be um, for you. Um, and if you are on a team, do you want to want to lead or be led? Um, some people like myself work really well on teams if I'm in charge of the team. Um, other people um, don't want to lead. They want someone to lead them. And that is totally okay. Um, I've worked with people who were like, please micromanage me because I have a really hard time, you know, prioritizing and doing all that stuff. Um, knowing, you know, do you need to be micromanaged? Which maybe you do. I personally go a little, a little nutty there. Um, so then, of course, we've got long term versus short term. Why did I get creative with this? <laughs> the, the boldies. Okay, so um, this has many different pieces to consider with ADHD. Um, but what it's most for me is like what motivates. This is more about motivation um, and being able to connect with a job um, and a task that you're doing. So one of the things about in one realm of long-term versus short-term is to think about like how much time you want to spend training for a job. So if you are thinking about like when you want to start working at a job and you find out their training is six months long, are you going to be able to stay engaged for those six months? And is that payoff going to be worth it? Um, if you have ADHD, it's really important to consider those things because if you get bored after three months of doing anything at all, um, a job that requires six months of training before you get to start in is not going to be a good time. Um, so taking into consideration that is really important. Um, how long does your interest in a project last? So perhaps you have things you like to do, you get excited about stuff, you can think about like at what point in the, the school year do you start to like hate your classes or whatnot and it's not just because of like the projects, it's more of like you're just having trouble focusing on stuff. Um, and this one it might be easier for you to recognize when you're out of school, um, but you might already know. Um, so if you sign on to a job that's going to require you to do like longer term projects, but you know that your, your interest in something only lasts two months, um, probably not wanting to sign on like a multi-year project where you don't really get, you know, gratification until the end good to consider. Again, what is your gratification timeline? How often do you need like wins? Um, and of course you could work with me in a, in a sense, um, if you wanna work with me and we can work on how to find small wins in a job. Um, but there's some people who like legitimately just don't, aren't able to maintain their interest in something when it's like super long, right? Cool, hope it's making sense, hope it's making sense. All right, hourly versus salary, this one, now, these are things obviously that everyone should consider if they're looking for jobs, right? Like I'm not, that's something to consider. But looking at ADHD, from an ADHD perspective, these are kind of the pieces that like are really important. Um, because for some people like our, hourly versus salary is just about like, I don't know, non, are, are, are you neurodivergent or you, no? Okay, so as a neurotypical human being, um, when you, when you look at hourly versus salary, like what are your like thoughts about Part -time, it? Part-time, full-time? Part-time, full-time, okay, all right. Or like even like these, um, what do you call that? 
when like, is it project based? Is it like yeah. you know that kind right. of job that might be more hourly? Yeah, yeah. So for the hourly versus salary in my neurodivergent brain, I see more of like deadlines and timeframes and boundaries of work. Um, and that's also coming from the nonprofit world where it's like you work all the time and get paid nothing. Woo. Um, so, but um, when it comes to deadlines, hourly versus salary can actually provide you certain types of deadlines. Salary, your deadlines might be kind of squishy, right? With hourly, you get deadlines every time you work because you have a set number of hours that you're supposed to be working. And if you need to finish a project, if, the, if they're like, no, you don't get overtime, you're probably gonna be more motivated to get your work done than if you're in a salaried job where you're like, well, maybe I'll work on it today at 2 a.m. when I'm feeling it, which is fine. Um, which also goes into like, how often do you hyper-focus on tasks, right? So if you are the type that really hyper-focuses and you might knock something out in, maybe you hyper-focus for a long time, a salaried job might be something to consider if you, if you want that space and flexibility. Um, but if you are the type similar to me where I hyper-focus and then I get like three hours of work done in an hour and I'm like, oh no, I have to come up with two more hours or else I don't get paid. That can be really frustrating. Um, Cause once I get into the swing of things, I, I like go for it. I'm in, I'm in there and I'm winning it. Um, but in other places, I, you know, I have worked, um, I have worked salary jobs and it was nice in the sense that I'd get up in the middle of the night and start working on something. And I had the flexibility of like, well, I just won't, I'll like work less tomorrow sort of thing or today because it's 2 a.m. Um, but it is good to think about what your motivators for working are um, because that's, you know, if you're hourly and you're expected to do a certain amount of hours or you're hourly and you need a certain amount of hours to feed yourself and pay your rent, but you work really fast once you're into it, that might not be the best place for you to be. Um, or maybe figure out how you can make that work, but good to consider. Um, so that also leads to how well do you stick to your boundaries? Because if you are in a salary position, chances are you're not going to work 40 hours a week. You might work more. Um, can you allow yourself to not be up every night at 2 a.m. hyper-focusing when you also are expected to be in the office eight hours the next day? Um, or, you know, you're hourly and are you going to like, oh, I just need a little bit more time to do this. I'm going to work for free. Um, look and see what your boundaries are and, and how that plays out in your pay. Um, because your time has value and you shouldn't work for free. <laughs> Coming from a social worker. <laughs> Don't work for free. You have a question. You have a question. Yay. Yeah. Yes. You want me to ask it? Okay. So here's the question from R. John 3. Will there be tips shared with us on how to screen potential employers to see if they're a good fit for our ADHD style? I appreciate everything that's been shared so far. It's been great food for thought. Nice. Well, we can potentially get to that. Yes, kind of. Well, yes and no. There might be more. Um, my brain is blanking on what's in the rest of this uh, PowerPoint. So we will, we can, I can, blah, blah, blah. Yes. If you don't get to it, we'll readdress yeah, it. At we'll the end. readdress. Yes, there is a space for que more questions. Um, so yeah. So here we go. Uh, w two versus ten ninety nine. So my brain uh, knows what those things mean. Um, do you have a better uh, explanation? I can try. Not really. Okay. I'm not so a very, very, okay. W two. <laughs> someone who's a W two is like an employee of that. Uh, if you're a W two employee, you work for this this person. They are your boss. You you are a person who is employed by a person. They give you a paycheck with taxes deducted. If you're a 1099, you're a contracted worker, and typically taxes aren't going to get taken out. You're responsible for pulling that money out and setting it aside and paying it back to the government later. Um, 
W-2, you're like employed and you're probably going to be employed until either they fire you or you quit. <laughs> um, but with a contract 1099, it's possible that there's a time frame on it um, or you have the ability to just be like, bye. <laughs> um, so depending on what the contract is. Um, so like you might be a 1099 where you are, you know, going into say you're a music therapist and you are 1099 because you go and you do an hour music therapy at the nursing home once a week um, and then you leave and they just pay you your one hour fee and that would be considered 1099. You could also be a 1099 at a nursing home where you work 40 hours a week. Um, I wouldn't do that if I were you, but you could be. Um, and that makes it good and there's pros and cons to both. Um, but essentially, um, most of the jobs you see, unless they say contract, it's, it's going to be W-2. Um, but good to pay attention to these things because um, if you have, if you're a 1099 position or a contracted worker, that means you are probably going to need to be finding new jobs. And you want to think about what's your comfort level with finding new jobs. Um, you know, contract can be great um, for ADHDers because uh, we'll get to that in the next slide. Um, that goes into the next slide. Um, question, how comfortable are you doing your taxes? Um, as a W-2 employee, you're going to get that W-2 and you type it into, for me, I just do H&R Block and it tells me everything. 1099, you're going to have to do a little bit more work um, for that. You're going to have to keep track of it, which leads to how uh, can you set aside money? Um, if you are a contracted worker, you are the one that's responsible for setting money aside to pay taxes later. If you're not good at doing that, and many people with ADHD are not, self-included, um, you're, you were, will take a hit um, and end up potentially having to pay lots of money later, um, which you don't want to do. Um, so that's kind of things that are very are, are typical just in general to want to consider but when it comes to ADHD finding a new job doing your taxes setting aside money those are really really big challenges to to ADHD folks um yes I have a question Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. so going back to some of your previous slides yeah so the W-2 I'm thinking would that be more attached to salary and then 1099 would that be more attached to hourly no, you can actually be an hourly and paid hourly and get a W-2. Um, so I've all of the hourly, not all of them. So if you're working in like an organization, um, so you might be paid hour, an hourly. So I'm hourly paid right now. Yeah, but she would be considered W-2 because it's uh, not a contract. So that's not always true. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. then this reminds me of like your accommodations mm -hmm. things. Would this be, because you're saying this is hard for people with AGHD, the mm -hmm. setting aside money and then doing taxes, could this be a reasonable accommodation that you could ask for and, and an employer saying like, or just even ask, um, do you provide financial assistance or do you, do you have a CPA that could help me? Could that be a possibility? You could certainly ask an employer if they have recommendations for CPAs. I don't know if that's a conflict of interest, um, but this is one of those like barriers and societal barriers that, you know, employers are kind of like, especially in North Carolina, you're here, you chose to be here. This is how the payments sort of works. Um, now, if you, you know, could work with an employer on a case-by-case -case basis, I'm not super sure. I haven't actually gone into like, the payment of things, I think they should, right. um, but you know, um, if, yeah, I wish that would be cool. Right. Um, but I'm not sure, uh, if, if employers would be willing to do that, if that's reasonable, cause that would be a lot on them, I right. suppose. <laughs> um, but great question. We should do that. Employers should provide stuff. <laughs> All right. So routine versus variety. This this goes, this goes to job as a whole. It can also determine whether or not you want to do like a contracted position or a regular just job. Um, so how do you handle transitions? Um, so this can be within the job. It can be between jobs. Um, if you're like anything like me, I am so bad with transitions. Like I don't like change. I like things to stay the same. Just 
yeah, I like variety in a sense of like, you know, doing different stuff, but I don't want to have to like change my office every couple of months or um, start a completely new project in a completely different area or whatever. Um, so it takes me a while to transition and I, and I get, it takes me a while to get back to my equilibrium. So that's why it's important to, to think about um, how well you handle transitions. Um, if you're like, how do I know if I'm good at handling transitions? Beginning of a new semester, how freaked out are you? <laughs> um, how long does it take you to get into the groove um, of the semester? For some people, it's like a week. For me, I found it's like three weeks. Um, and I'll still be like, hey, 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 hey help me. Um, so um, handling the transitions and that can kind of help you determine like what type of job you would wanna go into because if you know that position is gonna be lots of change, constant change might not be the best. Um, but also what type of change? Because if it's like, I stay at the same desk, the same time, my hours are the same, it's just the stuff that I'm doing is different, that might be fine, um, but it's really good to reflect and, and figure out like what sort of transitions are and changes is comfortable for you. Um, another piece is how motivated are you by new experiences? So for some people with ADHD, the novelty is what is enticing. So if something's new and shiny, it's going to be more intriguing to them. So if you're in a job where things are constantly changing, you're given new opportunities, new people, new stuff, that's, and that's what like really gets your brain going, then, you know, go for it. It also might mean that having contract positions, if you have that sort of novelty seeking and you are, you know, good at finding new jobs, maybe a contract work is a good idea. And that would allow you to try a lot of different things. Um, maybe you like that. That to me makes me anxious. I don't like that. But for some people, not changing a job every once in a while makes them anxious. So it's really what works best for you, but it's good to keep in mind and be realistic because I know for a fact, if someone's like, this is a three month position, I'm like, nope, sorry. I don't want anything to do with that. That's not for me. Or someone else might be like, oh yeah, three months. That's just as long as my attention span lasts until I'm burnt out and don't want to do it anymore. Um, in my heart, I want to be that person, but I know that I'm not. <laughs> um, so another thing with change, like how much warning do you need to be comfortable? Like what type of time do you need to prepare to then go into other work? So one thing is if you're in a job that puts you on call, is this a job where you know you're going to work that day when it, you know, the night before, like you're on call for the next day and they tell you the night before, yes, we're going to need you. Or is it like, you have an hour, get to work. Because that in the state of your like flow state um, can really um, be important. Um, if you're, you know, if you're ever spent the day in waiting mode because you have a 2 p.m. doctor's appointment and you don't do anything beforehand because you just like can't, um, having a job that could call you at any moment during the day, probably not going to work out for you um, because you're just going to sit and be like, are they going to call me? I could be doing something right now, but I'm not. Brain won't allow me. Um, so keeping that in mind, my mom was a NICU nurse for 40 years and was on call all the time. And I just like don't know how she just like cleaned casually while awaiting someone to call her. I'm just like, nope, not for me. But it could be for you. Maybe you like that sort of thing. Um, but good to consider. So those are the little five things to consider about yourself. Uh, lots of things, small but exciting. Another piece, real quick, who are you in the group project when you're thinking about a job and where to work and how to work on a team? Um, some, some things to consider when you're in a group, because yeah, I know, I know, we all, not, I won't say we all, but many people despise group projects, myself included, but you know, they do, if, if we have to do them, let's at least take some information from them in a helpful manner. So what role do you take on when you're in that group project? What annoys you the most about the group projects? Um, how do you manage your time and tasks? Um, how much do you care when you're in a group project? Um, and what motivates you to do well? Is it the grade? Is it not letting your group mates down? Is it revenge about your group mates to do a better job so that they look bad and you look awesome? Whatever those motivators are, um, are good to think about when it comes to thinking about what type of job would be good for you and your ADHD. Because 
group projects are kind of like a miniature work environment. So understanding and seeing what your behavior is like. And none of it's wrong. It's just, um, you know, there's no wrong way to do, group, I mean, yes, there is a wrong way to do a group project. And person who was in my group project right at the end of in my MSW program, I still remember you. Um, but um, I know what you did. Um, but it is good to think about how you work in those environments because chances are how you work in a group project is going to be pretty similar to your experience in the workplace. Um, generally, right? Think about the group projects that you really enjoyed and why they were enjoyable and the group projects that really sucked and why they sucked. And that might give you some insight as to what you need in a work environment, right? Um, also use your resources. ADHD isn't the only set of letters that, you, that can influence your experience at work. So I'm an ENTJ, haha, <laughs> Myers-Briggs. Um, I know that that influences the way that I work and that my ADHD also interacts with those things and makes me burn out faster than other commanders. Um, so I know that about myself, but use the, the University Career Center to better understand yourself, um, taking their assessments and working with them to identify your strengths and weaknesses. Um, I, I don't know all of the assessments that are offered, but I'm, I know that there are a lot of them. Um, Currently we have the Pathway U, Yes. Um, so that one's really good. You can find it on our website. As long as you have a nine or net ID, you can take it for free. Yeah. So those types of things are really good um, to help you kind of focus your and your and, and help spark your self understanding. Last little note: self employment and ADHD. So I started my own business this past year. Um, I am self employed. It's been scary. I'm not going to lie. It is hard. Um, one of the things I want people to remember, and I and I talk to, to with this about talk to my clients about this all the time, is that you can't do this alone. You cannot do this alone. Work, life, you can't do it alone. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with that. It is very easy to be like, no, I'm going to prove people wrong. I'm going to do it completely independently, all by myself. Don't help me. I don't want help. Okay, that's fine. You're totally allowed to think that way. However, let us all remember that Beyonce has a team, okay? And no one questions Beyonce's talent because she has a team, right? No one's questioning Beyonce. We're not like, oh, Beyonce, you know, she's okay, but look at all the people that she has helping her. No, when has anyone ever said that other than you have the same amount of time in your day as Beyonce? No, no, she has a team. <laughs> um, but that's the thing. Having a team of people is really important, um, even if you're not doing a bit having self-employment, but especially if you're considering self-employment, having an accountant. I have people that answer my phones and do my intake paperwork and track people down when they don't pay me. Um, and I'm like, hey, I've got this call. Can you take care of this? Those are the people that are keeping me successful. Um, I was in a coaching group that helped me sort of get some of the preliminary stuff with my business started. Um, I have a clinical supervisor, which is required by my licensure, but having that person is really great to check in with them, right? Um, so, and I have, you know, I have a therapist, like I have those support people because you can't go about this alone. You really, really can't. And I am using can't intentionally. Um, if you have ADHD, I highly recommend if you are considering self-employment, you can do it with a team um, of people supporting you. Um, and sure, you have to pay money, but like, it's worth it. Um, so questions, um, comments, concerns. There was a comment, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. um, so Cheyenne, before she left, just wanted to oh. tell you, she had another meeting to go okay. to, but as an employer, I look forward to sharing this with our management team and adding accommodations where we can. Thanks all. Yay! We've already made an impact. Made an impact. See, it was a teacher. You are the future. That's awesome. And then I think, what was the question we had before about tips and things? Um, I I will there be tips shared with us on how to screen potential employers to see if they're a good fit for our ADHD style? So I think what, what you can do, my, my suggestion, my tip, I guess, is sort of take the information that was in this 
and sort of come up with your list of like needs for work. And when you're screening employers, applying those things. And if you have, you know, when you're, um, you know, applying those things, great thing to do in an interview. You don't have to be like, hey, I have ADHD. Um, how, do, how can you help me? But say they're like, you see that there's flexible hours. Ask them what they mean by that. Um, if they say, you know, you, you're touring the, uh, maybe you're touring an office space and you notice that it's open concept. Being able to say like, oh, um, what other types of options do you have like work-wise? Like, how does this work? Um, like, how do, you, how do you determine who sits where or any of those pieces? Um, do you offer work from home days? Things like that. Um, I can try to come up with a list in my afterwards to potentially, um, but does that sort of answer the, like when you're screening? John, is, does that answer your question? That's helpful, okay. okay. Yeah, because everything, everyone is unique in, in their, their experience. Um, I would just say kind of the self-reflection and identifying your needs and then applying them when you're looking through a job description. Um, you know, touring the place, like if you are going to be in person, like if they're just going to take you into the building and plop you, like you're just going to get, you know, cornered and put in a room and interviewed and you don't see the rest of the space, like say, can I take a tour? <laughs> um, because, you know, maybe they say, oh yeah, we're great. And then you walk in and you're like, oh wow, it's just a whole row of distractions and desks and awfulness. Um, so but also it could be helpful to maybe talk to some of the individual employees that are currently there. Yes. And like networking with them, talking with them, asking some questions about what's the day in your life? Can you tell yeah. me what that, that looks like? Yeah, what a typical work day is a great question. Like what would a typical work day look like for me? Um, is definitely something you wanna ask um, an employer because that will give you an employer and then maybe an employee or two <laughs> to see how they, and see how they differ.